If you've ever wondered what it would be like in the Mojave after the events of Fallout New Vegas, the overhaul known as Dust would be more than happy to answer some of your questions for you. Set 20 years after the Courier made less than favorable decisions and took the independent ending, the world of Dust is a mess. Tunnelers overflowed from the Divide, the NCR is in shambles, and the Legion resorted to eating each other out. At least that last one there hasn't changed much. Perhaps the most important change gameplay-wise is that you don't take on the role of the Courier, but instead take on the role of a random survivor, just trying to leave the dust-ridden land. You'll soon learn a little bit more about dust if you don't know very much about it, but this run is going to be a little bit different than my last two playthroughs. Instead of playing around with the sanity system, this time around the challenge we are going to be trying to tackle is only using melee weapons. Without further ado, let's throw on our thigh highs and see if you can beat Fallout New Vegas while only using melee weapons. Starting off here, I named my character. The first thing that I came up with was Emil from Halo Reach. Shout out to you, you sexy scarred demon. You enjoy standing around with your thumb up your ass. Damn straight hot stuff. I made myself look like a cashier from Walmart before selecting my special stats. I ended up going with a high strength, endurance, intelligence, and luck while leaving pretty well everything else as a dump stat. Perception got nerfed, charisma has always been a little bit of a joke, and agility becomes so low from penalties that even if it were at 6, it'd still be knocked down to 1. Like usual, I dropped all my stuff into one of the metal boxes at the start before finding a safe house that was up to my low standards. I end up in a shack that is just southwest of Novak and I loot as much as possible. Most notable is the kitchen knife that is the only weapon that we have at our disposal. It isn't great, but it will kill. Hitting the non-existent road with my kitchen cutlery, I end up running for my life away from the tunnelers. These four-legged Satan worshippers are definitely one of the most obnoxious things in Dust. I do love Tunnelers and Lonesome Row, but Dust basically took out all the cute geckos and replaced them with my sleep paralysis demon. I ended up walking for a long period of time after escaping and somehow ended up at Cottonwood Cove. More Tunnelers were in the valley nearby, so I ended up continuing to push west towards Nipton for a very special item that we have utilized in the past. One of the things that is really sad about Dust is the complete lack of life and loot. It seems like everywhere I look I expect loot, but I find nothing. I know that it makes sense, but that doesn't make it right. My first enemy was a Bark Scorpion, and I was able to dodge around with my minuscule amount of health before eventually getting to the Prospector camp. Here I was able to grab a Sunset Sesperola bottle cap, and ultimately face my first demise when a Tunneler jumps out at me out of absolutely nowhere, causing me to poop my pants and my butt plug to fall out. After that whole fiasco, I go see Brockflower Cave. One of the advantages of always playing with a high survival character that is built for Redchild is that healing items provide additional health. This is the same for Brockflower, which we'll learn here in a little bit. Another Bark Scorpion later, and I run across some tribals. Death happens so suddenly in Dust that I can't really describe what situation led me here, but just know that I was running for my life, and all of my nine sphincters were puckered. Hoping to do a little bit of trading, I come across the caravan that normally spawns in the overpass just before Novak. Everybody is about as conversational as me any time I go to a family gathering. Dying my way over to Nipton, I found two non-hostile survivors, and they really made me feel at peace. Several tunnelers then appeared and killed them almost immediately. To survive, I ran up on a ledge and waited for the tunnelers to run away. This allowed me to end up taking everything from the survivors themselves before hopping back up and looping around the town to get inside a familiar looking building. The very large backpack looks a little bit different in my game because of the fact that I installed the mod to decrease the size of it. This is because it looked like absolute trash and I never know when a hot fanboy will show up. After restoring my health with some plants, I kill a nearby tribal after doing a little bit of dancing around with my knife. Knowing that I was no match for the rest of the tribals, I left the tunnelers to take care of them while I walked the long way around. This ultimately led me to the town of Prim. Here I ended up getting blasted in the rear so many times that I felt like I needed to get an IUD just to ensure that nobody as slow as me would have the opportunity at life. Moving closer towards Good Springs and killing another innocent survivor, I found myself being quite paranoid about the condition of the world around me. It's a very creepy atmosphere that is simply not present in the base game outside of dead money. Over at the Good Spring Cemetery, I kill the only remaining settler in what was once a peaceful town. I'm sure to grab his shovel as well as the one sticking out of the pile of dirt nearby so that I could access Chance's grave. This blade is fast and deadly, so it's definitely worth grabbing. Besides, grave robbing is a great pastime according to Sam and Dean. Heading into the Good Spring Saloon, I deal with a couple wild dogs as well as pick up a couple magazines most notably fixing things. At level 2, I ended up picking up a very important perk for melee players, Super Slam. After drinking a little bit of toilet water and grabbing a few medical supplies from Doc Mitchell's house, I'm able to put the perk to good use at the schoolhouse on some ants. 
It may not be very noticeable in the dim lighting, but this perk really does do well when dealing with a large group of enemies. One thing that Dust has plenty of. I push in a little bit closer to the center of town where I'm able to deal with three more wild dogs. Being able to dispatch three dogs without any ammo and in one life made me a little too confident. So confident, in fact, that I end up taking down a few Night Stalkers before exploring a little bit more for some extra chems and supplies. Outside, three tribals stand atop of the red brick, but with my shovel I'm able to take them down surprisingly well. Maybe melee weapons aren't as bad in dust as I had originally thought. I did take quite a beating regardless, so I returned to Good Springs Saloon for a little bit more toilet water before investigating the nearby Good Springs Cave. At level 3, I'm able to pick up Radchild. Being able to grab this perk so early on means that I will have to waste less healing supplies and food to restore my health. Good Springs Cave itself was completely overrun with Night Stalkers, so I had to be very careful to dodge them like questions relating to my own sexuality. What can I say, I love taking down hot dogs and hot dog buns. One thing that I still can't take down very well are the Tunnelers outside of Good Springs on the road to Prim. Dust is obviously built on the old game, so it's a blast getting to see old dialogue. Here you can see I talk with a dog who's actually Victor. There's one that's even funnier later on, but we'll get to that one after we make our way further into the video. Trying my hand one more time at Prim, I ended up taking down another survivor before getting to where the old NCR camp was. It's kind of interesting seeing who changed and what was different, but I can't say that I wasn't sad not seeing familiar faces in all of the right places. Despite the two powerful perks that I grabbed so early on, them being Super Slam and Radchild, I was not able to tank all of the explosives that these survivors had. This caused me to die many times and eventually I was able to take them down one by one and sneak into a building where I could use it as a choke point. This allowed me to control exactly how many enemies were present and let me grab the Stonewall perk. We find out later on that this perk is either broken or not as all including as what it led us to believe. I kill some more cannibals inside before peeking my head outside and putting the sacrificial knife to good use. This thing swings insanely fast and will actually carry me for the rest of the run, but for now it's able to tear through several cannibals and leave nothing but blood and gore in my wake. Things do get a little bit close with a couple melee attackers, but thanks to Radchild and the new perk that we picked up, I didn't really take that much damage. Sure, I almost died, but the melee enemies weren't the ones who did the majority of the damage. It was the negative self-talk that I have in the mirror every morning. Popping over to Bison Steve Hotel, I end up clearing out more cannibals with very little effort. I mean to tell you that I didn't die here at all, and I am truly one of the fallen to biggest players of all time. How do I make up for my small stature and miniature hot dog, you may ask? I hack computers to blackmail people into liking me, thus allowing me a little bit better of a vantage point when I go to attack all of the cannibals. This allows me to lure all of them towards the back half of the building and pile them all into a nice tidy pile. Being decimated once again outside, I charge in a little bit faster and I'm able to put down the enemies with a little bit extra force like you see on those police documentaries. Taking a step out back of Prem itself, I ran across several tunnelers. I'm not sure which developer placed this particular rock here, but I thank you for it and you are very sexy. While up on the rock waiting for the tunnelers to run away, I took the time to access the crafting kit. I don't know that I really expressed how amazing that this kit was the first couple times that I played Dust, but it really is a lifesaver if you don't have some of the quality of life mods that I have installed. Most notably, the splints that you can create. While they don't heal you that much, walking across the Mojave with a broken limb while being chased by six tunnelers is not a very fun pastime. Wanting to try to avoid all the combat while moving around the Mojave, I stuck to the hills and looped around Hidden Valley. As I pass my way through Black Mountain and the Indiana Jones scene, I come across a safe house full of life and respite from the harsh land. Howdy. Arguably the biggest mod that I installed that changes dust is the Brimstone mod. This adds a completely new settlement full of submissive individuals that happen to love being caged up. Inside, there were a lot of really nice places to loot, as well as just the comfort of knowing that you were relatively safe here as long as you didn't steal anything from anybody's pockets. I even met some of the really cool vendors such as Julia and a makeshift Vendertron that couldn't repair anything very well at all. There were a couple of useful things in here like a medical brace, but outside of that there wasn't a whole lot of value with these NPCs. Someone who would be insanely helpful, much to Batman's pleasure, was Alfred. Alfred was able to accept a lot of my ammo and gear due to his relatively high cap count. The best addition made to Brimstone in my opinion is the existence of a doctor. If you did have broken limbs, this would make this whole location so much more worth it, but because of the fact that we have Ratchild, we really don't benefit from this very much at all. Unfortunately, outside of that, there wasn't really a whole lot to do in Brimstone. There were a couple repeatable quests that were arguably fetch quests, so I didn't stick around very long and hit the road once again on my way past 188. 
out from my neighborly jaunt, I ended up coming across so many feral ghouls. Unfortunately, I ended up taking too much radiation damage from them, causing my ultimate demise. On the bright side, I do look pretty comfortable when I fall and die. Wanting to avoid that hot mess, I pop over to Boulder City. I picked up the Ghost Hunter perk a little earlier, which allows me to put down all the ghosts easier. Because of how healthy these guys are, they really do take a long time to kill, and when you get a group of them, they can prove quite damaging, especially with their firebombs. Fortunately, between Super Slam and all the melee perks that we have at our disposal, I'm able to do a decent amount of damage when I'm only fighting one. This forces me to skate back and forth trying to dodge all of their attacks while trying to get them to converge on one spot, such as a doorway or my bussy. Hopping aboard another railway system, I come across the wreck caravan with multiple survivors guarding the spot. Rather than leave them be, I decide to charge at them with nothing but a melee weapon. Surprisingly, this proves quite successful, and I'm able to level up to grab the irradiated beauty perk. In Dust, there is almost no way of dealing with radiation. As soon as you get it, you pretty well keep it. This perk allows us to sleep and reduce our radiation by 100 rads. That may not sound like very much, but when all you need to do is sleep for a few hours to remove all radiation, it becomes a no-brainer. This is especially useful with the amount of radiation that we're going to be picking up here shortly. And those of you who have watched me in the past know that I absolutely hate the sewers, especially the first time around when I had no clue what the hell was going on. This time around, I'm even more powerful without needing ammunition, and I know roughly where I need to go. Because of this, I'm able to tear through all the cannibals inside. Not without resistance, but very efficiently. Once you know where you're going, the sewers really aren't too bad, especially if you're able to get through quickly, thus reducing the cost of food and all of your supplies. That being said, I did have several close encounters that left me waiting to restore my health thanks to Radchild. One of the things that we ran across the first time around that I didn't have to worry about this time was radiation. I had such a hard time keeping my radiation down, especially because I kept going to the radiation room with all of the barrels. This time around, anytime I had too much, I was able to get back into shape just by sleeping. If only that was the case for real life, I'd have a six pack. While all of that is pretty rad, one thing that isn't is the fact that the Stonewall perk that we picked up earlier in the run did not work very well at all for whatever reason. Any enemy with a bumper sword caused me to fly back ridiculously far. Other than that though, I didn't have too much of an issue and was able to just blindly wave my spear back and forth, dealing with the enemies with very little issue because I'm experienced in using long cylindrical objects. All of that ultimately led me to the final area. I of course dealt with a cannibal who is dressed in full metal before taking his axe and dealing with all of his friends. I pretty well just waited at each of the choke points for them to come at me, but I did get a little aggressive at certain points, allowing me to get to the safe at the bottom of the effigy where the key is located and wandering my way back through all of the irradiated water. Trailing my way through that which is the sewers, I was able to get back to where I had started, and the only exit to all the sewers if you don't have access to an extensive amount of lockpick, North Vegas Square. As is common with us, this place is also completely overrun with cannibals. I utilized as much cover as I could and broke out when necessary, allowing me to clear all of them out and sleep inside of the bed to reduce my radiation. Just outside the gates of Freeside, I eat a bunch of strange meat. This allowed me to shift my sanity to insane, allowing me access to interesting perks as well as hallucinations, which are very common in Freeside and the Strip, two places where we're going next. Inside Freeside itself, there were a lot of feral ghouls, but fortunately I had my calloused hands and the ability to restore any radiation should I just get a little moment of respite. Because we had just turned insane before we grabbed all this experience, I was able to grab the Scourier perk, which increases my movement speed by 50% while decreasing my limb capacity. This is one of the few perks in Dust that I actually really like, and I wish that it was implemented in some capacity in the main game. I personally feel like you move too slow with how much walking is required in Vegas, so this perk is naturally one of my favorites. Sneaking inside the west side of Freeside, I kill a few more feral ghouls while trying to avoid all of the dead money cloud that completely obstructs your vision. I was even able to take shelter briefly at the location that the NCR normally hands out food at. It looks like they're still doing something to a similar capacity to help numerous survivors, so me being the very upset spaghetti noodle that I am, decided to kill all of them instead. This allowed me to grab all the food for myself before killing the three grandmas outside. I gotta say, certain parts of Vegas does still have its charm even when completely surrounded by dust and awful game mechanics. Stepping inside the next section of Freeside using the back door, I end up finding a giant centaur that is one of the hallucinations I mentioned just a second ago before killing a few more ghouls and getting to the main gate. Here a giant death call hallucination jumps out of absolutely nowhere and sends me to the Shadow Realm. If you play your cards right, you can end up accessing different parts of the map much faster and almost use this room as a way of fast traveling. One downside about the door that takes you to the strip is that it places you within the Gamora Suites. 
Gamora is unfortunately known as one of the worst places in dust for survival resources. While you can certainly drink from all their toilets, all of the halls are completely overwhelmed with cloud victims, and there is almost no food in the entirety of the casino. Meaning that if you don't get through this place very fast, you are sure to starve to death like we almost experienced the first time when we played through this area. Despite our weaponry, we still aren't able to get through this area unscathed, as is tradition of dust. No matter how you feel, you will always be at the bottom of the food chain if the enemy gets a good hit. With a little bit of a struggle, I go on a large slaughter spree, allowing me to grab a bumper sword, one of my favorite melee weapons in the entirety of the game. This thing could almost one-shot most of the enemies if I was able to land a good hit. Not much happened here in Gamora, and it was just kind of a mindless combat slog reflecting how insane that I had already gotten. There was a really fun kill where I jumped off the second story down to the strip area to get an Assassin's Creed-like kill. This allowed me to get to level 10, so I grabbed more repair and the King Arthur perk. This supposedly allows you to do 25% more damage with melee weapons, but I'm pretty sure that it's either broken or doesn't work as effectively as I would have thought, and that the 25% is not added on the top, but rather earlier in the calculation. Heading down to the armory where you normally place the thermite, you can access the secret grate that sends you to the cash room. This cash room allows you to hop into the transition period to get to the tops. This is all stuff that I didn't know before this playthrough, so I'm mentioning it now to hopefully save you time if you end up playing through this overhaul yourself. Another thing that I'd like to mention is the fact that there are a lot of explosives in this area, and if you aren't careful, they will certainly kill you. Once at the back side of the tops, I deal with several more feral ghouls, keeping a close eye on my radiation counter before popping inside and dealing with a handyman, and running across way more feral ghouls than I was equipped to take down. As a result, I circle stripe them and run across the entirety of the casino. Popping back once again into the elevators in the rear of the casino, I end up finding a secret stash that contained the strip gate as well as a hatch that led down into a vault. Here I was able to pick up an all-purpose science suit which allowed me to further increase my radiation resistance as well as a key card that can get me inside of the Lucky 38. Another area that we didn't have enough resources to take care of in our last two runs was Michelangelo's sign business. This time around, with the help of a substantial amount of Kims, most notably Turbo, I was able to shove my spear into all of their orifices. Hopping right across the street, I ended up stepping inside of the NCR Embassy and killing supposedly what would have been Ambassador Crocker. The bumper sword here really does amazing work, and I love how it just ragdolls everything when you combine it with a Super Slam perk. Sleeping a little bit more, I step out into the cloud where the feral ghouls are at. One thing that was really tricky about this area is that I not only had to manage my radiation, but the damage that the cloud provides. Typically with Radchild, you can almost completely ignore the cloud, but because of the ghouls, we needed to reduce our radiation a little bit to add more room for error. After taking a quick little break in the area that isn't full of cloud and resting up a little bit, I'm able to put down all the feral ghouls and step inside of the Ultralux. We've already covered this a little bit in the past, but I'm able to grab the note and carefully avoid all the terribly placed traps before getting into the penthouse, where the forecaster had finally holed up. He does have some interesting gear, which I do tank, most notably of which was Joshua Graham's armor, but I don't end up ever wearing this armor and instead decide to bounce back into the cloud. I had thought that now would be a good time to grab the experience by rejecting boarding the vertebrate, so I made my way through the terminal and killed a bunch of feral ghouls. I was even able to save Torres to be able to trade various items including buff out and a doctor's bag, which did make me hope for the future in case I ever wanted to try to do another run of dust that involved the use of ammo. Heading out to the back of the airport, I have one of the largest fights in the entirety of this video. I found myself surrounded by a crap ton of feral ghouls and I popped every single chem that I had to ultimately get aboard the roof. After rejecting boarding the vertebrate, I decided to hop out front and kill a bunch more feral ghouls. There soon afterwards, I got back to the monorail system and checked out the Lucky 38 Labs. Something interesting that I did find here was a cryo gun. I couldn't test it out and see what it actually did, but I thought it was interesting, and I was also able to grab several Kims. Outside, I was able to repair all of my gear with jury rigging, one of the many perks that I had picked up during our massive experience boost at Camp McCarran. This made everything so much more enjoyable because I didn't have to utilize broken gear. But after I step onto the path to Freeside, I run across my arch nemesis, the death claw that scares the poopy out of me. I ended up picking up a spot down at the southern portion of the map that overlooks the crevice that I normally like to go to that is full of geckos before fighting multiple tunnelers. I was feeling pretty powerful at this point and I enjoyed being able to actually play the game without dying very fast, most of the time at least. One thing that never changed was the fact that guns could certainly still kill. Fortunately I was able to get to another vantage point at Bradley's shack and I was able to put them all down and step into what used to be Caesar's Legion's safe house. Here in the tunnels below is a Dead Brotherhood of Steel member that has a note that tells us where to go to find a couple different escape routes. 
The one that we're going to acknowledge in this run that we haven't explored in the past is the train tunnel near Nipton. We do need five explosive charges, according to the notes, so I decided to push north and run across several NCR rangers who had very damaging bullets. I decided to run past them this time before getting around to Novak. I'm not sure what happened here, but any time I ever went into any of the buildings, my game decided to crash. I became really upset, so I just decided to hit the road and completely avoid all of them. Another death later at what used to be the Lonesome Drifter, I once again came across the 188 and fight a bunch of feral ghouls. Heading a little bit more to the southeast, I end up passing by Bitter Springs and ultimately overlooking Guardian Peak. This area is one that could have had great potential, as there are numerous survivors at the very top of the mountain. Unfortunately, the Guardian Caves that I need to get into were locked, and I even checked the numerous survivors' pockets for any keys. Unfortunately, they were empty inside just like me, but I knew that there were several ways into Guardian Peak. Heading out into the minefield below, I of course blew up, but of course after waiting a little bit, I'm able to head back down to where the boat was at and find the somewhat covered version of the entrance to the cave. Normally this is used as an exit and you are introduced to Lake Mead, but this way allows me to fight several feral ghouls before ultimately getting to the C4 explosive that I needed to complete this run. I was also able to find another entrance into Guardian Peak that I couldn't find earlier that involves shimmying up the wall here. With how close I was to the now drained Lake Mead, I decided to revisit the home of the one who had laid all the explosives just to appease those of you who haven't seen my previous video. After disarming a trap at the entrance, I beat up a Skiratron and died so many times due to the courier. Previously I was able to just stealth kill this guy with a ranged weapon, but this time around I wasn't able to get very close so I ended up having to pop a turbo to have a lot faster of a reaction time. After dusting my hands clear of that mess, I hit the road. Along the way I had definitely faced several bloodbaths, but a moment of respite appeared as the NCR hit squad appeared before me and had a rather respectable conversation, despite looking like they were going to eat my pants for breakfast. Rather than attacking them in cold blood, I decided to return to looting their former members. Taking the train tracks south of Nipton, I'm able to find the door that was referenced in the Brotherhood of Steel's note. It was of course locked with an average lock. This forced me to level up a little bit more to get enough experience and skill points to put towards lockpicking. My exploration took me to the Mojave Outpost to see that there was a locked gate to the Long 15. I think it would be interesting to see what it would be like to play Dust with a high lockpick, but until then I'm going to slaughter everybody inside of the outpost before making my way south for even more experience. I'm able to kill several survivors at the police station as well as several tunnelers before getting to the NCR Correctional Facility. Now overrun by survivors as well as the very few children that are in Dust, I take down all of them as well as these random two survivors for the extra experience as well as the armor to repair my own. At this point I was utilizing the courier's armor rather than the lab suit for the increased radiation resistance because I wasn't going to be fighting as many feral ghouls. It wasn't until I cleared out everyone at Sloan that I was able to finally reach level 18 and be able to spec all of my points in a lockpick as well as grab the explorer perk because at this point all I wanted was faster movement speed to leave this freaking hellhole. Keep in mind throughout this entire time I could not fast travel, so I was forced to find new and interesting ways to get around. Breaking my way inside of the lock, I'm able to utilize the charges that I collected from the caves and enter Big Mountain. This is actually one of the areas that I have not visited in the dust, but that being said I definitely wanted to get through it fast. Using the perimeter warning, I was able to fast travel to the camp that you find Christine's rifle at. Here there were tech scavengers that I had to prove my worth to and die several times. As soon as I got into tight and in close quarters, I was able to tackle a bunch of them, but unfortunately the person that I had came here for did not have the item that I wanted. I needed to find a teleporter to get me to safety because that is what my life has resorted to rather than more realistic methods of escaping the Mojave. Unfortunately, this guy here prevented me from leaving, so after dying a half a dozen times, I was able to have another trip session as I experienced the different water levels in Big Mountain. For posterity's sake, I did want to say that I did try to go into the sink, but I wasn't able to thanks to all the Brotherhood of Steel standing outside. Fortunately, one of the two locations for the item that I was looking for was available, and I was able to get through it after dying multiple times thanks to toaster mines. At the cuck's nest, I was able to grab the transponder, and I stepped outside to use it with so much excitement that I forgot one of the largest parts about dust. The fact that everywhere you go there is an enemy. This prevented me from using the device at all, so I ended up walking around mindlessly, avoiding everything for quite some time before ultimately getting the device to work and stepping through the end area. Fortunately, I was able to get through relatively unscathed and complete the final and fourth ending of Dust. If you made it to the end of the video, chances are you like my content. If you are interested in supporting it and joining the wall of names on screen now, consider checking out my Patreon using the link on the screen. 
With all that out of the way, I've been Al, but do me a favor, won't you? Have a good one.